But don't you think, Kent, that that it may not have been altruism on their part as much as they know they've just been exposed. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, uh, they're not doing it out of righteousness. They just know if, he, if we do this, and he knows that we've set this up, then we're guilty of even the greater sin of, you know, of the, what they're doing. To me, it's the very question that they ask him as they set him up. Obviously, the law of Moses and, and Jesus, what they perceive as Jesus' disregard for the law of Moses is at issue. Mm -hmm. So as they bring this woman before him, they, they ask the question with regard to the law of Moses. They say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law, this is verse 5, commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? It's almost, we're going to see if he really is going to be obedient to the law of Moses or if he's going to challenge us now a second time with regards to breaking it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting too, clear over in verse 41, they accuse him of being born of fornication. Mm -hmm. It, it's interesting to see how they just won't let this drop. They'll do any. They just keep coming back with one more issue and another issue. And as Kent mentioned earlier, they've lost the vision of who he is and what they can learn. They're so fixated on an end goal that they refuse to stop and consider not only their ways but but who he is. Well, let's look at that particularly. Let's look at uh, at that concept of perception and light and darkness because. After he then says to the woman, neither do I condemn thee, go thy way and sin no more. Now notice what they say in verse 12. Then Jesus spake unto them. Now the them is the crowd of people, particularly the Pharisees that we and, and see that have set up this trap, saying, I am the light of the world, and he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now that's a pretty direct statement right there. That's pretty bold declaration of who he is and what he's offering to them. The Pharisees therefore said unto him, Thou bearest record of thyself. Now what is what's what is he saying there? I mean, yes, he has been bearing record of himself over and over and over again. Why did it why is that even a question? Well, one is not to do that. Okay, why? Because one cannot become a witness legally. Uh. For oneself. So you have there to have must additional be witnesses. There has to be another to corroborate one's words. So, so in a sense, they're calling him on a, a, a point of the law, once again, allowing a quibble over the meaning of a scriptural passage to blind them. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it, it really, really is a sad, a sad deal. But let me come back to before we okay. go too far from the from the woman uh, and Jesus' response to her. I want to make uh, two observations. One is this story does not appear in the earliest manuscripts of John's Gospel. And it appears not to have been originally in his Gospel text. But, in my view, it's authentic. That it's a real story, it really happened. That it's not something that someone made up. There are a couple of stories very similar to this that show up in early Christian literature retold about an experience of Jesus. And I think on the basis of those and this, uh, I think one can can say very reasonably that this is a real story. Having said that, that means that chapter seven and chapter eight are basically of the of the same piece. We're talking about the feast of tabernacles and so on. Okay, now second point: Jesus stoops and writes on the ground, and it just dawned on me today. I was looking at at a passage in Moses chapter six. And talking about a book of remembrance, which is kept among us. Remember this expression, mm -hmm. Moses chapter 6. It says, according to the pattern which was given by the finger, finger of God. Jesus writes with his finger. And I ask myself, is there any connection here? Maybe it's sort of on the edge. It's not a main, main event, main part of this. But on the edge of this story stands the idea of the Creator who reveals the power to write to his children, presumably Adam and Eve. Uh, the text never does quite say, but uh, but he is the one who who is the revealer of this sort of thing. Here he is, kneeling, stooping before others, writing in the writing the earth. And in, in Exodus, it's the finger of God that gave Moses yeah. the law. That's right, on the stone. 
So there's the, there's the sense in which Jesus' finger inscribes. And those who now appeal to the law have to look back to the one who inscribed it with his mm. finger on the law. Here he is writing it. In Interesting dirt. imagery. So th there's not only the reference back to the Exodus, but there's also the reference back to the period before, closer to the creation, which Jesus captures in this action. It's uh, it's pretty astonishing to mm. me. Interesting. To see the connections. Uh, you know, and back back to this, the law, the lawgiver, and the very finger of God being writing there. Notice what he says to them when they call him to question again, saying, well, the law requires at least two witnesses, and you can't be one of them. And notice how he says to them, well, first of all, my testimony is true, so don't say my testimony isn't true. And besides that, I do have another witness. Who's the other witness? The His father. father. And boy, that is what really hits the fan at that point. So now, how is, what is he saying then about his relationship with the Father, and how do they react? And, and really, this is where he is not only calling them on their very thing that they're condemning him for, but he's teaching very profoundly who he is and what he came to earth to do. Well, let's look and see what is it that he's, he's saying there. I, uh, let, me, let me just add, as, we, as he finishes with this section, uh, and we're still in the backdrop, he, the, the women in a, taken in adultery um, certainly ties in here, mm -hmm. but it, as that ends, this notion of light, he once again bears testimony, so he's identified himself as living water. Mm -hmm. But then in verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world. So with these these magnificent menorah that have been lighted, that mm -hmm. broadcast their light throughout the city, he now begins to identify himself as that light. Yeah, and, those, and those symbols are pointing to me. And, and that imagery will continue on through chapter 9 with the man born blind mm -hmm. um, this notion of how we come into light how we see when we're in darkness mm -hmm. we, we now yeah now we come back to the point that that rises at the beginning of chapter 7 my time my critical time the time that I choose has not yet arrived and he arrives during a festival and makes a stunning announcement mm -hmm. it's really wonderful yeah it's in delightful. fact let's look at that uh, where he bears testimony. I, I love the verse 18. And I am one that bear witness of myself. There's one witness. And the Father that sent me beareth witness of me all, uh, of me. Then said they unto him, Where is thy Father? I can almost hear it. Where is thy Father? Now, I think Jesus has made it rather clear in many of his sermons where his Father is and who his Father is. And what his Father taught him. Right. And so how does he, instead of saying where my father is and gives them the locale or the direction, look at what Jesus says. He brings it right back to them, and the challenge to them is, you don't know my father. You don't know my father because if you knew my father, you'd believe me and love me. In fact, his parting shot to that thought is verse 21. He says, you'll die in your sins. Mm -hmm. Because you've chosen not to know the Father, you'll, you'll keep what you've chosen to keep. Yeah, and look at that phrase when he says there, because it's once again the spiritual imagery of what he's teaching there in the doctrine, and you're going to die in your sins, and where I'm going, you can't go with me. 